Some of you may remember that I spoke from this text the last time I preached on Lord's Day morning. I was not able to spend as much time as I wanted and, and emphasize certain aspects of it. And so I wanted to return to it again and do that this morning. With the focus and emphasis this morning being, I've made you a covenant for the peoples. This is what God's, God has done in, in, in the revelation of his will and his purpose to have a people for himself. This is God's will and God's purpose. Now, in our Bible lesson this morning, uh, during our discussion time, uh, we spent a long time talking about God doing his will and his purpose. Now, that's what this text is about. It opens here with these words, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nation abhors. You see, we know that this is the prophet who says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. So when we, when we think about the revelation of God from on high, it should not be surprising to us at all. It should be surprising to no one, and it's not to us. That the things that are revealed, the things that were preached, whether by whether in the law and the prophets, or whether by his apostles and prophets in the spirit, they are foreign things to the earth. They are things that grate against the flesh. They are things that, that interrupt and turn upside down, so to speak, the plans of men. Amen. As in the days of Noah, huh? What plans were made? What plans were being executed? And the Lord talked about in that very day, they were marrying and giving in marriage and did not know until the flood came upon them. God's will, see, God's will. Egypt, things going along smooth. Yeah. And, and, and all the nations honoring and fearing Egypt as at that time, in the days of Moses, one of, if not the premier world power. And then here this man who's been gone for 40 years appears in Pharaoh's court. Who recognized 40 years? He was, he was a middle-aged man when he left. He was a prince of Egypt, so to speak. And here he appears again, and he's been a shepherd for 40 years. He's an old man now. And he makes, you can imagine someone in the crowd in the court saying, what did he say? Did you hear what he said? Let my people go. See, God just asserted himself right, into, right in front of the throne of Pharaoh. My firstborn, you will let them go. And God had promised Moses, he will let them go. I will compel him to let them go. They will pay you to leave. They will beg and plead for you to leave. Now, see, this is an example of how God asserts himself. How he asserts himself. Sennacherib stood outside the walls of Jerusalem, demanding this and demanding that and taunting But God asserted his will the next morning. When the sun came up, 185 soldiers didn't get up. Right. His ways are not the ways of men. His thoughts are not the thoughts of men. The ways and the thoughts of God, inter they, they intervene. <laughs> in the ways and the thoughts of men. Because man has turned away. Man has rebelled and rejected the ways of God. As a race, the whole earth has turned away. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the apostle Paul that confirms, there is none righteous, and of course he's quoting from Moses and the prophets, numerous places when he says these words, none righteous, no, not one, 
There's none who understands, none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There's none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb with their tongues. They have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. In the way of peace, they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. So the prophet calls and says, let the wicked forsake his way. The unrighteous man, his thoughts, let him return to the Lord. That's the call from on high, see. That's the announcement. The, there is a way out of this. There is a way out, but you've got to be willing. You've got to be willing. The report is he will have mercy on him. And to our God, that is return to our God, he will abundantly pardon. And then he gives this warning. We, we, we don't often see these words as a warning, but they are. They are a warning. For as the rain comes down on the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth blood, that it, I mean, bring, bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. Shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Now you see, that, that doesn't harmonize with a message that supports the appetites and interests of men, does it? There's a conflict there. And God says, I send my word for what I please. For which I, the thing for which I sent it. See? Now this is the context in which we need to see these, this uh, declaration. In the words of this prophet here. Man has rejected the one that God has chosen. We're at the point here. In revelatory history, if you want to say it that way, or halfway, Isaiah is halfway between Moses and Jesus, approximately. And it's gotten to the point here where men have heard enough. And God, where, where, where heaven can, there's a lot to be called account for, or called account to for, I should say. <laughs> men know a lot at this point. Not everything that they will know, but they know a lot. And God continues to push forward. There's more. There's more coming. There's more on the way. There's more on the way. I'm going to do this. And these are things that God's going to do. And again, as was said this morning, God takes this counsel in himself. He hasn't counseled with anybody else. He hasn't asked anybody. There's been no votes. There's been no referendums. What do you think about this proposition? Well, what do you think about this proposition? You know, there are places here in this country where, where they... Uh, uh, cities and municipalities and states and counties and so forth will have referendums. Well, what do you think about this? Somebody will propose this and somebody will propose this and there will be a debate about this and a debate about that. No such thing when it comes to God's will, his purpose, the thing for which he is working. There's no such thing. He simply announces it and declares it. And, of course, that grates against a, uh, particularly our generation, huh? Particularly our generation. Because we're used to having our way. One way or another, I tell you, if the leaders won't give us what we want, we'll just throw the bums out, won't we? Put somebody in there who will give us what we want. Not so. See? We're in a different realm here. Completely different realm where we're talking about God's will. And that's why this is not acceptable to the nominal church member, the nominal religious person. It's not acceptable. People will submit themselves to lots of things, won't they? All kinds of athletes can submit themselves to abusing and misusing their bodies in all kinds of ways. And, and, and employees submit themselves to all kinds of things for the sake of their careers and for the sake of the company or for the sake of the project and on and on and on and on. But we know here, from our perspective... I, and I mentioned this earlier this morning, the starting point is deny yourself. Yeah, 
Now you're in a position to start. <laughs> that's not way down the road somewhere. That's just, that's just the entrance right there. Deny yourself. See, so this is, this is where we stand here then. Let me remind you of this text here, one of the Psalms that we know very well that we, we talk about often. Psalm 2, why do the nations rage? The peoples plot vain things, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. God counsels in himself to do his will. What are men doing? They're counseling with one another about how can we get out of that? How, we, how can we throw this off? How can we thwart this because we don't want this? See? Now, that's the context in which God is working. This defiant and rebellious fleshly world, even, even in the religious realm, even in the religious environments. We like to set the agenda. Thank you very much. I like this. I like this. I like this. I like this. I don't like that. I don't like that. We'll set the agenda. Thank you very much. And... Many of us have had this experience. When you come announcing and declaring what God has said he's going to go do, he's going to do, or he has done, you get the reaction, where did this come from? This is some strange gospel. This is not gospel. But, of course, they're using their own frame of reference, aren't they? See? We are going to define what's gospel. That doesn't sound good to me. Let me remind you of the words of Ezra. The hand of God is upon all those for good who seek him. But his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. Amen. See, now we're ready. <laughs> now we're ready to think about this one whom God anointed and sent into the earth. And who gave himself gladly. Here am I. In the body you have prepared for me. Behold, in the scroll of the book it is written of me, I've come to do your will. Your will. Come to do your will, he said. Led by the Spirit, even into temptation. This time of test, who can right at the, right at the front, right at the entrance, see, no man knew. He'd been declared in the Jordan, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then he left and went out to be tested, led by the Spirit, to be tempted in the wilderness, alone. Yeah. Forty days, ate not, nothing to eat. Then the tempter came. Yeah. See, led by the Spirit into this. This is where it started because he was the one appointed and sent from heaven. He, he's, the, he's the intruder, see. So the, the God of this world was up for the challenge, wasn't he? He thought he was. He met him there in the wilderness, a place not, that, that could not sustain human life, a place that could not sustain human life, but... The reality was this man was not sustained by the earth, was he? Amen. He was protected and watched over from another place. Yeah. In the acceptable time I've heard you in the day of salvation, I've helped you. I will preserve you. So the father preserved the son, you see. And the son gave himself to the father to do his will, patiently waiting, announcing the kingdom of heaven. Then he returned from this test and announced the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He went into the synagogues, Judea and Galilee, and everyone spoke of this man. The word spread without cell phones. The word spread. God is able to get his word where he wants it. Amen. Revealing. He, he, the father revealed the son, and the son revealed the father. 
things that he had seen with the Father, things that he had heard with the Father. We speak that. I remember what he said to Nicodemus there. We speak that which we've seen. We tell that which we've heard. And so he had a different kind of message, and he spoke it from a different perspective, didn't he? Yes. Never did a man speak this way. That's right. They'd not heard things like that before. And the reality was, and he would say this later, that the Father loved the Son, and he'd given all things into his hand, all judgment, all things, all people, and so Jesus demonstrated this. He demonstrated this. Now, there were some tender-hearted souls who had been prepared, of course, and he went about and he gathered them to himself. Yeah. Come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Amen. They left everything yeah. and followed him. They turned from John, whom they recognized was a prophet, a mighty prophet in word. Not indeed, because he did no sign. But the word was enough. They recognized that. But, and, and then as soon as he gave the word, because of the power of his word, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, they left him and followed after this Jesus of Nazareth from Galilee. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, it did. Yeah. And they were quick to see it, weren't they? Amen. They were quick to confess. We have found him, said Andrew about whom Moses and the prophets wrote, come and see. See, these tender-hearted ones who, who were already yielded to God, who already had an appetite and a hunger and a thirst, and they were willing to give up what appears was their family business. How many generations had that family been there in Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee doing that work, and they forsook it? We don't know. The record doesn't tell us. May, perhaps they were forsaken by their families. How could you do this? How many generations have our family been doing this and you're forsaking this to follow this man? We don't even know who he is. But they could not resist because their hearts were tender to God's truth. And they'd been prepared for this time. And he himself chose them. He himself chose them. Matthew got up from his table, left his cushy government job, we would say, wouldn't we? <laughs> and followed after this man. Made a public declaration, so to speak, by inviting all of his acquaintance, all of his business associates, come to my house, meet this man, I'm retiring for his sake. <laughs> you might say it that way. Because he could not resist this one whom God had sent. Others resisted him. Others despised him. Rejected this one who came from God, but not these men, not these men who had no schooling, who were not approved, had no seal of approval of the religious authorities and, and the religious hierarchy and the religious environment, none whatsoever. They'd never been heard of before. They'd come from a place miles from Jerusalem, not even in Judea, much less Jerusalem. And they, jo pardon me, they joined themselves to him and would not let go. Even when the crowds did, they would not let go. And they saw things that no man knew until the record was written. They saw those things, the things on the sea, in the storm, mm -hmm. on the mountain, when the cloud came down. Moses and Elijah and the glory of God expressing itself in the sun. Mm -hmm. His hair changed, his clothing changed, his skin changed. They saw those things. Peter, James, and John did. Now, they didn't tell it till later. But they saw those things. See, they were the ones appointed to see those things. Well, why didn't, why didn't Matthew get to see those things? Why didn't the other Simon get to see those things? God has his appointments, you see. And those who belong to him, they don't fuss about that. They don't argue about that. Why can't I preach like, like, like Brother Michael? Why can't I preach like my own sons? You know? 
Well, they've been granted to see some things that I haven't been granted to see. They're not serving me, and I'm not serving them. We are serving our God who's revealing these things, see? Now, there are places where you run into things like that, don't you? Where there's human jealousy and bitterness and, and, and protecting of territory and establishing a place. You don't come inside here. This is mine. But not among those who are yielded and willing and sensitive who want to see and know the glory of God. They're not just protecting their place and their possessions, their position. Not at all. They've already denied themselves, you see. <laughs> Following after him. We're all walking together in fellowship. He's called us into fellowship with, his, with himself. God has in his son Christ Jesus. And we've already talked about this morning from many aspects how we're glad for that very thing. The Father was glorified in the Son. The Son was glorified by the Father. And our Savior is able to do His work. He was heard because of His godly fear. The record says there in Hebrews 5. He yielded Himself to the Father in all things. Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me, he said. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. God gave this testimony in Jesus himself. It wasn't separate from him, some message that was separate from Jesus. The message, Jesus was the message. Remember outside of Lazarus' tomb there? He said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. He confirmed, he nailed it down. This was not an accident. This was not coincidence. He was doing God's will. God was directing him, and he was following And the prophet says, I give you, I preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people. Give you as a God made this covenant. We know different aspects about the, the covenant. The word there is to select or to feed, uh, to render clear, to choose, to render clear, that is to, to clear away any, any, uh, anything that, that, uh, is not pure, that is not right, that, that, that's not beneficial and effective to the purpose. That's part of the idea in the word covenant in the Hebrew language. Uh, to choose, to cause, to choose, to eat, manifest, to give meat, in the sense of cutting, it involves a sense of cutting a compact uh, because it was made by passing through the pieces of flesh. You remember the image or the, the experience there of Abraham when he went in, had, had a... Uh, 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 the darkness came down on him there in Genesis 15, and uh, a smoking pot passed through the animals that he had cut. God made that covenant a confederacy, covenant a league. More than 270 times the words translated covenant in the Old Testament scriptures. Then in the New Testament scriptures, it's translated 33 times. The Greek word is translated 33 times. 17 of which are in the book of Hebrews. The words used, half the times it's used in the writings of the apostles and prophets is just in the book of Hebrews. And five of those are quotations of Jeremiah 31. <laughs> One from Moses. So the Father and the Son were in league. They were confederates in this heavenly and 
Of course, it was an eternal endeavor. And so we know it was not just meeting the needs of men. This is something they'd always been doing together, and they've continued doing. They've incorporated us into it, you, should, yeah. you could say. They've incorporated the human race now into it, uh, actually only the believers. Only believers are incorporated, actually involved in it, and actually participating in these things that the Father has done. Heaven is imposing. Now, the, the covenant of Moses was imposed, although they were asked, would they do this? Would they be involved? And they say, yes, we, we'll do everything that he commands, they said there at Sinai. But in this new, different, better covenant, this covenant that supersedes the previous one, this covenant of which the previous covenant is a part, we know, don't we, because of what the Apostle Paul says, that this covenant that we're speaking about, the covenant of Christ, was really the original covenant. The one that God made with Abraham. The promises that God said when he said, I will this. I will do this. I will bless you. I will make you a blessing. I will give you this land. I will. The covenant of Christ is part of all of that. I mean, all of that is a part of the covenant of Christ. And, Mo and, and the law of Moses is a part of that. It was added to this covenant, these promises, the things that God was doing, announcing, reporting, and declaring, then the apostles and the prophets in the Spirit did this. They announced, they declared, and they reported, this is what God has done. This is what he accomplished. You know what Peter did on the day of Pentecost? This is that. And he quotes from the prophet Joel. God had said he would do this. This is what he's doing. And it's because of Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. See, that was their message. God had done this. No man knew. No man could participate in this. The Father and the Son did this together. And so God has imposed this covenant then, this covenant. The Savior said, in my blood, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not talking about a ritual of the Lord's Supper mm -hmm. here. It's much larger than that. The Lord's Supper is part of that. But what he's communicating to us is that he himself is the covenant. Mm -hmm. It's not a religious experience that we enter into. Mm -hmm. it's, not the, the, our, it's not our involvement or participation in religious activities, in a religious ex institution. Or organization. It's our participation in him. It's his life. Given for the sins of the world. A ransom. He gave himself as a ransom. For many. This covenant of course is one that. A person must enter into. You join yourself to it, and you forsake all else. You forsake all else. That's what Noah and his family did. They forsook all else. Mm -hmm. They joined themselves to God's purpose and will, and they entered into the ark, and God shut the door, and everything else was shut out. Yeah. Everything else. They cast themselves upon the Lord as they were cast upon the waters. And trusted him to provide, and he did, didn't he? Yes, he did. Amen. His promise was good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brethren, this is what we have done. Yeah. Yeah. We have entered into Christ, and we've cast off every other thing. Now, when we first entered, maybe we didn't see all the implications of that, but it's opening up to us Amen. more and more and more. This is what the apostles were doing when the believers entered into this on the day of Pentecost. Yeah. They didn't know the, all the implications. Mm -hmm. They knew it was very, very large, and they were devout men from every nation under heaven, and they wanted this. They wanted this. Cornelius and his household, they were already tender toward God, devoted to him. They wanted to know and see, and so God, in his grace and kindness to them, sent for 
had them send for this man who would declare to them a message that they needed to hear, and they gladly heard and yielded themselves. Who could deny water for them to be baptized, to enter into and join themselves to this one who was the covenant? Yeah. So it's already established then that there's no question about heaven's involvement. Heaven's done all of this. The Father has done all of this. The Son has done all of this. And there's no question. Will anybody believe? Will anybody care? Well, yes, they will. God has a remnant. He's down through the generations. He's kept a people for himself, hasn't he? Despite the rebellion and rejection of many or most. He has a people for himself. The only question then for us, is my name written there on the page white and fair in the book of his kingdom? Brethren, everything that we need is there in that covenant. Everything that we need, all the promises of God are yes and amen in him, aren't they? The participants, let me give you a list of just a few things. And this is not everything, but just a few things that are, that are declared to us and revealed to us. Like the, the obedience of faith working in our hearts that the Apostle Paul talks about there in Romans. By the Holy Spirit who leads those who are his. Mm-hmm. Amen. That's at work in his people. That's right. And it's provided for in Christ Jesus because he grants us that faith. He is the embodiment of it. He's the object of it. He's the fulfillment of it. And so those who believe in him, they just give themselves and offer themselves, their bodies as living sacrifices. This is just what they do. They're glad and willing and yielded. Heaven has called us into fellowship with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Heaven has granted us comfort that comes only from God. Assisting us to labor and work here below. And to endure the afflictions and the troubles. Those are just a few statements from 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Of course, the focus of our Wednesday evening meetings for some weeks now. Have been the things that are revealed there in Ephesians. Every spiritual blessing. In heavenly places. And then expounding that and opening that up. Showing us how far, how high, and how deep, and how long and how wide is the love of God in Christ Jesus. It's in him, see. It's in him. We don't need to go someplace else. We don't need to develop anything else through human uh, ingenuity or creativity or education. It's there. Mm -hmm. So those who believe just continue to investigate and look. They just continue to look at him and so are ever changed because it's there. The provision is there. We have a godly hope laid up for us in heaven and revealed in the gospel of Christ, Paul said in his letter to the church in Colossae. We're enabled by God's power with zeal for works of faith, labors of love, and steadfastness of hope. That's what was working in the believers in Thessalonica, who, by the way, had only been believers for a few weeks, and it was already working in them. See, this is the course of things in this covenant in Christ Jesus. And, of course, this text has been mentioned several times this morning already. The grace of God that brought salvation teaches us. It teaches his people and produces in them a zeal for good deeds, a people whom God can possess. Heaven grants us support and guidance to love the things that are excellent, to abound in the knowledge of Christ, to be filled with the fruits of righteousness, to the glory and praise of God. That's part of Paul's prayer there to the church in Philippi. This is what works in his people. Those who engage this covenant that provides everything that we need for life and godliness. Now those are the words of Peter, aren't they? Everything that we need, God's glory and virtue with exceeding great and precious promises in Christ Jesus, everything we need for life and godliness, fruitfulness in the knowledge of Christ, for an abundance entrance into the everlasting kingdom of Christ Jesus. 
And finally, Jude says then, he will make us stand in the last day. His grace and mercy helps us in our time of need, the Apostle Paul writes there in Hebrews. And John says, by these and more, they will overcome. Those who are with the Lamb will overcome Amen. by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. See, yes. So all of these things, and, that's, and there are many more. You know, there are many more statements that declare to us, reveal, and establish this reality firmly in our hearts and minds so that we'll know, mm -hmm. so that we'll see clearly, so that we'll be able to, as Paul says, take hold of that for which we are taken hold of mm -hmm. in Christ Jesus. So this is the covenant. Then, of course, we're granted a heritage as well. Now, the wicked, the wicked have this attitude. Depart from us. We do not deny the knowledge, or we do not desire the knowledge of your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? Now, these are words from Job. So it's obvious. The, the attitude of the wicked was obvious. What profit do we have if we pray to him. The wicked in their vain confidence says, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. God has forgotten. He hides his face. He'll never see. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, you will not require an account. See, the psalmist answers that question himself. Well, obviously, those people have no part those who have that attitude have no part in the inheritance of God. God has not prepared anything good for them. Yeah. He has prepared something, but it's not good. Yeah. It's not good. Sin has made the things of God's truth and righteousness, justice and wisdom and goodness desolate in the earth. Truth fell in the street, the prophet Isaiah says. Righteousness is defiled, godly wisdom is thought foolishness, and goodness is pointless, justice is turned back, and whoever cares about these things is a prey for the wicked. We'll just use them for what we want. See. Now that's the conditions of the earth. Jesus' life and teaching cleared that all away. And of course that made him a great threat. He was a great threat. Just being in his presence. The way he, with just a few words, would, would cut the legs out from under anybody who challenged him. Which it only took a few words. And somebody else would come then, and he'd knock them down. And somebody else would come, and he'd knock them down. Just every, from every quarter, from every corner. Men had littered God's field with thorns and thistles making it desolate for use by him. But Jesus' words and works cleared and plowed the fallow ground, mm -hmm. making it ready for good seed to be Amen. planted, Amen. which would then produce beginning at 30 times what was planted, beginning there. Yes, right. So the increase had a great impact. Yeah. His life had such an impact that you remember those final days there in Jerusalem. John's the only one who records this, that some Gentiles came. The message had gone, we don't know where. But here were these Gentiles in this holy place, and what were they looking for? Sir, we would see Jesus. Amen. That, was the, that was the sign. Mm -hmm. Everything was coming to the point of fruition. Mm -hmm. It was just about ready. Mm. Just about ready. And so this seed from heaven would fall into the ground and die. But in his death, he would bear much fruit. And these who came looking, those who had not sought me will find me. <laughs> well, they were seeking in a sense, but it's only because he came that they were provoked to draw near. Sir, we would see Jesus. And so the work then, by the Father's Son, this one who was sent from heaven, this one who said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. 
The works that I do are not mine, and the words that I speak are not mine. But they are the Father working in me. They're my Father's words. The things that he heard from the Father, he declared. And so the covenant was established. And just as he said, his disciples would do greater works. <laughs> they began to declare this message then of the great works of God that God had done in him. And it continued to increase. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. He will show them his covenant. Whoever has, to him more shall be given. He will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is the nature of the kingdom and the covenant that is in Christ Jesus. The covenant to which we have been called, in which we joy, in which is our hope that will endure beyond this earth, beyond our own lives, beyond our possessions, beyond our families, the place where we dwell now, it will not endure. But this covenant is an everlasting one which will not pass away, even as his words will not pass away. And we have joined ourselves to it and trusted that God is faithful and he is, and we are glad and we joy in it. Thank you, brethren. God's grace and peace to you, Brother Jeremy.